Well, good morning. Joey told me how long that time was supposed to be, but I forgot. So, uh, whatever it was, that it was. Um, <laughs> uh, before, I, I do want to open in prayer and uh, dive into the Word, but before that, I'm, I'm compelled to, uh, to share with you uh, two confessions and a, and a proclamation. Uh, the first confession, uh, if you did not receive a bulletin this morning, it was not Brian's fault, it was actually my fault. Uh, so I, I was bending his ear in the back and distracting him from his duty. Uh, I, I felt bad earlier uh, as he was running around handing around bulletins. Uh, that was my bad, uh, not his. Um, the second, um, as I, I talked to Joey earlier this week, and, um, and we were talking about just how the service flows and, and the church and things of that nature, and, and uh, he, was, uh, he told me that I didn't have to really be concerned about time, that, uh, that he preaches to long ends. And I, was, I recalled a, a time where, where he filled in for Aaron in our college and career ministry, and he preached, I think it was over two hours in one message. It was, a, it was, a, it was, it was over two hours in one message. So you, just given the context of who was telling me this, I thought, oh, well, I got like two hours th- this morning. And so I added to the sermon that I'd already prepared. <laughs> so anyhow, that's the confession is that my heart was tempted to, uh, to do that, but I did not. Um, the proclamation, um, as Joey mentioned, uh, it, uh, our church uh, really feels, and maybe you didn't mention this, but I was thinking it, uh, our church really feels and, and has a close kindred to, to you all. Uh, we love you. Uh, we pray for you often. Uh, I, I can't express um, how much we pray for you, how much we think about you. Uh, we have uh, home Bible studies uh, that our church has, and and our home Bible studies talk about you and pray for you um, and pray for Joey and uh, pray for your body. Um, so uh, just a proclamation of love for you. We, we love you guys. And uh, I'm so thankful uh, even to be here with you this morning to open God's word with you. Uh, you know, it's, um, it's a privilege as I, as I go to different places and uh, open the word with uh, different bodies of believers to have that, in, you know, that instant brotherhood, right? That instant uh, uh, kindred spirit uh, in Christ, and uh, there's no doubt that I've, I felt that uh, last night uh, as I spent time with some of you folks, and then this morning as well. So, thank you for having uh, thank you for having us here this morning. It really is a privilege. Uh, so, with that, let me open in prayer, and then we're going to jump right in. Heavenly Father, Lord, we we praise you. We thank you for the body of Christ. We thank you for salvation uh, through Christ and Christ alone and the opportunity we have to have hope in Christ and know that, Lord, that uh, you have saved us, and yet you have not taken us away from this earth, but you've left us here uh, to be a light to the world around us, and you've given us the body of Christ, you've given us the church to be equipped, uh, to be encouraged, to be admonished, so that we, Lord, can go out and make the disciples of men. Uh, Lord, I pray that this time this morning of opening your word will be a time, Lord, that is glorifying you uh, and edifying to us, fruitful for us as brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Those words are found in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. They were written by the Apostle Paul to his beloved son in the faith, Timothy. He wrote them from a Roman prison while in chains, having recently stood alone, abandoned by all, before a Roman council that condemned him to be executed as a martyr. His race was just about complete, and as it reflected back, he also also looked forward forward to the ministry and in life that laid ahead for men such as Timothy. I attend the same seminary as Justin, uh, Joey Mitchin, uh, as Joey did, and earlier this year in May, uh, Dr. George Zimmick delivered his final instructions after 50 plus years as an elder, a pastor, a teacher, and the dean and patriarch of the Esposito Seminary. He spoke of the past, but he also looked forward and spoke of what the men would face in the coming future. He spoke to men who have years and and decades and perhaps even a half a century of ministry ahead of them. As he spoke of the coming decades, it was as if he had already lived them and was going to live them with us. 
Uh, I think it seemed that way because they were so familiar to him because he had already lived them. What's amazing is that for thousands of years, generation after generation is replete of men of the church tenderly and faithfully exhorting and charging younger men behind them, looking back over their own lives and looking forward to the lives they've already lived, handing over the baton of faithfulness with a single message. The message Dr. Zimmick delivered earlier this year has been handed down by so many before him. It's the same message Paul wrote here to his son in the faith. It's this message that has prepared every next generation of faithful men and women who love Christ and the desire to remain faithful to Him in the midst of trial and persecution, sufferings and tribulations, disappointments and failures, attacks and betrayals. Preparing them, preparing us, brothers and sisters, for what we will encounter during our lives and during our ministry as followers of Christ, as lovers of God's Word. As men and women set apart to live holy lives in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. What is this message? In 2 Timothy chapter 3, which is our text for this morning, the Apostle Paul will give Timothy and in the entire New Testament church, us, three instructions to remain faithful in the last days. Three instructions to remain faithful in the last days. Now normally this is the time where, where I would give the first point. However, I'm, I'm going to hold off for a moment because I, I want us to feel the weight of the passage as it comes to us. Uh, so if you're a note taker, just write a number one in a blank space next to it, and then I'm going to come back to that one in just a few minutes. First one, look with me. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. Now Paul transitions from instructing Timothy in, in chapter 2 to hold out hope for the repentance and re restoration of those people within, the, within their midst uh, who are in error or even teaching error. And he transitions away from the instruction of holding out hope to, to now, he says, understand this, Timothy. He gives them a command. And not just any command, but a, a command of weight a command of importance. He gives him a warning. This is actually Paul's final warning recorded in Scripture. The, the word for understand this carries with it a, a dose of reality. He's instructing Timothy to actively, continually, repeatedly understand, realize, know this truth. To live each day, each moment with this knowledge in the forefront of his mind. What does Paul want Timothy to understand? to have on the forefront of his mind. Look again, but understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. Now at first it seems as though Paul is, is pointing to the future and telling Timothy that these times of difficulty are going to come in the future. But actually the context here tells us that he's talking about Timothy's present tense and the future tense of Timothy's uh, ministry and that of the New Testament church. And the term last days is used multiple times in the New Testament, and, and it refers to each time a broad period of time, beginning with Christ's first coming and culminating with Christ's second coming. So it's a day, as I stand here today, this, these last days span almost 2,000 years. We are in the middle of the 2,000 years, or the last days. And Paul, writing to his son in the faith, he sets his gaze on the future of Timothy's life, of his ministry, on the future of the Ephesian church, on the future of the New Testament church, on followers of Christ, brothers and sisters, children of God, us. And he delivers this warning. In these last days, there will come times of difficulty. Paul, looking to the horizon, warns Timothy, and us, that times or seasons will come in which we will encounter difficulty. The word for times refers to, to various seasons or epochs of time. Some seasons will be more difficult than others. 
some generations will encounter uh, more trials and more persecution than others before them. But the trajectory of the church age is one of a downward spiral, a, a perilous slide in which there will be particular seasons of pronounced difficulty, pronounced struggle, always getting worse, always running further and further away from godliness, away from holiness. And the word for difficulty in the ancient Greek can, can also be translated as times that are hard to bear, at times of great stress, even times of a great danger and violence, as the word is used in other places to describe the violence of wild animals. And believer, in case you didn't know, things aren't getting better all the time. We cannot turn back the clock. We cannot make things great again. At least not from a biblical perspective. Not, not from a godly perspective. And these, these next verses bear that out. We're not going to spend a ton of time in these next verses. They really speak for themselves. But as I read them, I, I want you to think about the nature of these descriptors. Who is the object of worship in these descriptors? The first and the last give us a clue. The first is lovers of self. And the last, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. This list describe people who bow to the idol of self. Our world beats this drum of self-love, does it not? I was listening to a podcast earlier this year. In the podcast, a young lady uh, began to tell a story. And the statement she made in this story uh, in some ways encapsulates the, the danger of the world, but, but also the danger the church faces today. And she said this, and this is a heavy statement. She said, I consider my abortion the greatest act of self-love that I did. I chose my life. I chose my goals. Thinking back, I wish I could go back, and she's crying as she's talking now. I wish I could go back and, and hug myself and tell myself it's okay to have an abortion. Paul tells Timothy to understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty where people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, Ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That sounds like our world today doesn't it? shouldn't surprise us. And yet every time I read that list, I find myself freshly somber, mournful, heavy-hearted. This list of depravity and sin is like the other list we find in Scripture. It most closely resembles the, the list given in Romans 1 where, where Paul is describing the nature of the world and why it has come under the wrath of God. It shares sinful descriptors with other lists given as well that describe worldliness and desires of the flesh. Lists like Galatians 5 and 1 Corinthians 6 and Colossians 3. However, this list is different than those. Because Paul gives one summary descriptor found in verse 5. One statement that places this list in, in a whole new light. Or rather, darkness. Verse 5 says, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. I was playing soccer with my 16-year-old son and, and a bunch of guys who are mostly in their 20s uh, a few months ago. I've been playing with the team for a couple seasons. I have been playing with them for a couple seasons, doing my best to, to not look like the 45-year-old that I am. 
and that during a scrimmage I stepped in to play goalie. And as I stepped in, I thought to myself, hey, if I do a bang-up job between these clo- posts, maybe I can play goalie more often. Uh, the reason for that is the rest of the players on the team run incessantly up and down the field. And I thought, hey, I can just stay right here, right? So in an effort to, to try to impress, I, you know, I'm diving for balls. And, and uh, I dived for a ball, um, not having full control of my body as I once did. And I land right on top, my chest lands right on top of the soccer ball. Uh, and I, I collected it up and in pride and, and uh, arrogance, I jumped up and punted it away and acted like nothing was wrong. And after I did that, I doubled over, um, having no breath. Like I, the, all the breath was just sucked right out of me, having landed on that ball. I couldn't breathe. When I, when I read verse 5, and consider the significance of this verse as it relates to verses 2 to 4. I, I feel as though I've dived on that ball all over again, as if the breath has just been sucked right out of me. Having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. When I consider the, the list of vile and sins in verses 2 to 4, we're not descriptors of the world, as Paul is writing, but instead, Paul is describing the so-called church. Talk about heavy-hearted. I love the church, and I read that and, and feel as like I've been punched in the gut, as if we can't breathe. I think it's time for our first instruction. Our first instruction for the last days is beware, beware of the so-called church because it looks so much like the world. Believer, in the last days, today, we are surrounded by professing believers, people who claim the name of Christ, people who walk around with an air of religion and spirituality. However, while claiming to be Christians, their lives are marked by the characteristics found in verses 2 to 4. They claim a form of godliness, but their works, their lifestyle, denies their own profession. And over the summer, my wife and I were, were talking with, having a conversation with our aunt, and she was thinking about and telling us that she was thinking about leaving her church that she's been a member of for over 50 years. I was talking with Matthew last night, and he was telling me how, uh, and reminded me that, that many of you have been here since the genesis of this church. You know, think about or imagine spending 50 years pouring your life into a church body and then having to wrestle with whether to leave the church or not. This is what was going on in her mind and her heart. She was thinking about leaving because of a theological and doctoral slide in her church. And I asked her to give me an example of, of what she was referring to, what she was concerned about. And she said in a recent sermon, her pastor said, said this from the pulpit. He said, life begins at first breath. And then he went on to stump for a woman's right to choose death from the pulpit of her church. A young woman like the, the one who I referenced earlier, or quoted earlier, who practiced self-love. And this is just one illustration of the pervasiveness of the world and how it seeped into the so-called church. And the temptation of our hearts, of my heart, if we're not careful, is to, to listen to the illustration that I gave and to look in judgment down on the young lady who really needs Christ. She really needs to, you know, needs salvation. That act is an illustration of the degradation and, and darkness of the world. But the world's always been that way, right? But Paul is not saying here to Timothy, Timothy, know this, understand that the world is this way. He already knew that. At this moment, as Timothy is writing this letter from, or reading this letter from Paul, he's already under persecution. He already knows what the world looks like. The significance is, is, is tying the, the young woman's quote to that of the so-called pastor. And we know that what to expect from the world, let's not be surprised by it. But the church, the church should stand apart. The church should be a light to a dark world, not take on its dark form, not celebrate it. 
And to that end, we, we must not look around and, and think that there's no way that the world could seep into these four walls, right? Perhaps not, uh, not on an issue like abortion. We're too solid for that. There's no way we'll succumb to the world's agenda on gender or on biblical manhood and womanhood, right? There's no way that we will look like the world in our parenting, is there? And certainly not on attributes of holiness and self-control, I don't think. Maybe. There's no way I'm arrogant. I'm very humble. I think I'm grateful. Before we get uppity about our own stuff, we must understand, we must know, we must keep on the forefront of our mind, believer, that the first place the world seeps into the church is right here. It is right here in our own hearts. It, it, it's so important because verse 5 says that that they are denying its power. The, the power he's referring to is the, is the very eternity-saving, life-giving power of the gospel, the power of God. And when someone chooses to love self, to love pleasure, uh, and deny God, it does not matter how religious they look. It does not matter how many times they come to church. It does not matter what they say. Their works betray their empty religiosity. Paul says to beware the so-called church First, by understanding who they are as lovers of self, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. He also says to beware the so-called church, and look back at verse 5, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. When, when you identify these powerless religiousers, barren professors, imposters, charlatans, false teachers, those who sacrifice the name of Christ on the altar of self-worship, he says, avoid them. Do not fellowship with them. Beware of them, lest you too be burned. As Paul looks at, out over the, the present and future of Timothy's ministry and that of the church, he gives two illustrations who, of the methods and schemes and future of these dangerous people who, don't forget the context, like wild animals, are seeking to stir up and create seasons of peril and difficulty for the church, for us believers. The first of these two methods is found in verses 6 and 7, where he writes, For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. These uh, charlatans, these creepers, they infiltrate the church. They, they, they seep into the church and act like predators, like, like jackals looking to pick off the weakest among the flock. They worm their way into homes and minds and captivate them, mesmerize them, kidnap them with their schemes. The word Paul uses here for women is, is not the normal word in the Greek. I believe that's intentional on his part. He's not indicating that, that all women are weak-willed, uh, but rather he's identifying a particular type of woman uh, who is already, who's already burdening, burdened uh, with her own sins, uh, to prone, is prone to being led astray by, by passions and schemes, is always looking, as he says, for the new thing, new information, but just can't seem to understand the truth. Because he's looking in the wrong place. These false teachers, imposters, they're dangerous. They're seeking to devour those who are weak using every medium they can. Paul gives us a second illustration of who these people are in verse 8. He says, Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth. Men corrupted in mind, and disqualified regarding the faith. This is an il interesting illustration. Uh, we, we don't know much about Janus and Jambres. Uh, they aren't found anywhere else in Scripture. Uh, they do, however, they pop up in different places within uh, ancient Jewish literature. 
They show up as foils or villains. They show up as imposters and spies, continually standing in opposition to the nation of Israel, uh, to Moses and to God. It's believed that Janus and Jambres uh, were the magicians who stood next to Pharaoh. It's believed that they left Pharaoh's house to infiltrate the nation of Israel, but only to oppose Moses from within. Verse 9 says that they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. They were false teachers. Church history is littered with men like Janus and Jambres. You don't have to name them. We, we don't have enough time to name them all. They're known by their works. They're known by their acts. In the 1950s, an ecumenical movement began. The movement called for various churches and denominations to, to set aside doctrine and even to set aside the gospel for the sake of unifying those who claim to be Christians, really for the sake of a false unity. Right? The, the, the unity that, it's amazing, the unity that, that, that my church in Jacksonville has with the unity of this church in New York City, in case you didn't know, we have very little in common between the two of us, right? Uh, I come from the land of trees and big trucks, and you come from the land of concrete and no trucks, right? And so from a, well, very little trucks. Um, we have very little in common except for what? Christ. We are unified in Christ. We are unified in His Word. We come together and we're like brothers and sisters. Why? Because of Christ. And here this movement is calling for this fake unity, manufactured unity, setting aside the real unity of the church, which is Christ, setting aside the real unity of the church, which, which is doctrine in the Gospels and the Scriptures, for this fake unity. The aim of this movement in large part was to undo or untie the binds of the Reformation, to bring the Catholic Church and, and, and the Protestant Church together under one umbrella. Martin Lloyd-Jones refused. In 1966, he, he stood in the gap and, and called out to all faithful churches, to faithful pastors, to all faithful believers, to not take the hand of fellowship with these imposters, with these opposers of truth. He went as far as to refuse to stand on Billy Graham's stage, stage side by side with Catholic cardinals and liberal Protestants who were imposters to the church. Instead, he held tight to the power of God, to the power of the gospel. Now, these imposters, they're, they're corrupted in mind. They're disqualified, the text says. They're, they're secret agents seeking to devour and cause turmoil and strife and division within our church. But they won't get very far. Their folly will be plain to all. Brothers and sisters, beware of the so-called church. Understand who they are. Be on the lookout and avoid such people. Which brings to our, sec uh, to our second illustru in instruction for the last days. Second instruction for the last days. Take courage. Take courage in the testimony of your life. Take courage in the testimony of your life. Paul, in his final letter and, and warning for a moment, turns his attention away from this picture of, of the future of Timothy's ministry in, in the church. And as a father, he delivers a word of encouragement by, by looking to the past. He, he says, you, however, setting up a contrast uh, between the lives and characteristics of the so-called church and, and that of Timothy's life and character. Paul's intention in this comparison is not to encourage Timothy to, to beat his chest uh, because he's so much better, it's not to well up with pride and accomplishments. Paul's aim is to, to draw a contrast in order to encourage Timothy to continue on the path that he's on, to not veer off course and to not panic. Because when difficulty ensues, 
We're to, we're to look back and see the faithfulness of the Lord and what the Lord has already done, what He's already accomplished in our own lives as believers. And then to perse- persevere in the faith. Look with me at verse 10. He writes, You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. Man, you see the contrast, don't you? You see the contrast in verses 2 to 4, and now these descriptors here. The 18 character traits of the imposters in 2 to 4 that identify a a life of self-worship, a life of self-love, a life of denying God. And now Paul highlights nine indicators of God's sanctifying work in Timothy's life. Work that he can look back on and see the evidence of. Nine life traits, nine descriptors of a man who is faithful, a man who seeks to honor God in all that he does, a man who considers others more significant than self. Notice first who Timothy followed. He hasn't followed the world. He hasn't followed after the false teachers and the imposters. He he stands apart. He, He looks different than the world around him. He's faithfully followed Paul, the apostle, of Christ Jesus. The wording here gives the basic sense of of following beside, closely, both in deeds but also in in mind, in in his understanding. It denotes the the intimate relationship that Timothy had with Paul and how he he paid careful attention to follow him as closely as he possibly could. In a way, this this reminds me uh, of when I'm carving a rotisserie chicken in in the kitchen and my two dogs come over and stand as close as they can possibly get to me. I have to like chew them away from me because they can't get close enough to me. Salivating for, looking for, hoping that they can get something from me. And everywhere I go in the kitchen during that time, they're right on my heels, ready to consume everything that I will give them. Now maybe I erred in comparing Timothy to a couple dogs. His father was a Gentile. But in a similar way, Timothy has followed after Paul, staying right on his heels, going everywhere he goes, taking everything Paul will give him, and then asking for more. I encourage you to to come back to this list sometime, to this chapter even, and study it further. This morning, we really don't have time to dig deep into it, otherwise I will be up here for two hours. But I do want to point out, however, a a few important points. The first thing on Paul's list that Timothy followed was what? His teaching. Paul's teaching. Everything else flows from this one. Paul wasn't concerned with Timothy following after him personally. He he was encouraged uh, that Timothy followed after the teachings of the whole counsel of God. Timothy was Paul's constant companion. He went everywhere he could with Paul, and when he wasn't with Paul, he was going to where Paul had sent him. Paul poured himself into Timothy. He poured his teaching into Timothy. He poured the whole counsel of God into Timothy. And as it was, God's word that Timothy followed after. Paul uses this word for teaching 19 times in the pastoral epistles. The word is synonymous with doctrines. A few examples are, he uses the doctrine of God our Savior, Titus 2.10. A sound teaching, sound doctrine in 1 Timothy 1.10. Doctrine according to godliness, 1 Timothy 6.3. Purity in doctrine, in Titus 2.7. He's telling Timothy to, to be encouraged because the pattern of his life, the pattern of his testimony, bears out a devotion of following and adherence to the doctrines of God. He follows that by encouraging Timothy that his, that his own life contrasts that of the so-called church by way of his conduct. The false teachers, the imposters, will be found out due to their conduct, their lack of fruit, their unholiness. And the same goes for Timothy. He is already found out because of his godly conduct. Paul tells Timothy, look back over the course of your walk with Christ. Be encouraged by the fruits of sanctification, by the fruits of your works. I believe the same goes for us. I was talking with my son uh, some time ago, and he was wrestling with assurance of salvation. 
as many teenagers do, as many adults do. I didn't tell him that he was saved. In fact, I told him that I couldn't do that. It's, it, it's not my job to tell him that he is saved. But I did point him to the evidence of his life. I pointed him to look back, to focus backwards, to the evidence of the life he has lived since he professed Jesus Christ as his Savior. To look at the fruit, to, to evaluate your aim, evaluate who you are following. Jesus Christ tells us in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will what? Keep my commandments. 1 John 2, 3, and by this we know that we have come to know him. We, we can have assurance of salvation. We can know that we are saved by what? If we keep his commandments. Philippians 2, 12 and 3 says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. We are to, to look back over the course of our lives as believers and work out our salvation. To see the fruit, to see the evidence, to see the conduct. And when we see it, what do we do? We know that God is performing the work in us. We know that he is to receive the glory for that work. And we are to be encouraged and then move forward. Continue the course. Do not veer off. Take courage, brothers and sisters. Be encouraged by God's testimony in your life. Don't chase after new ideas. Don't chase after new fads in Christianity and new teachings and doctrines that come along your way. They're coming all the time. But instead, look back. You see the evidence of salvation in the course that you are on and stay the course as you move ahead. Why is this encouragement needed? There's always an occasion for encouragement. And however, as he looked back on his own life and ministry and then forward to the life ahead for Timothy, for the church, and for us, Paul had a particular reason to deliver this encouragement. We see that reason in the last two descriptors of Timothy following, of Timothy's testimony. He says, you, however, have followed, verse 11, my persecution and suffering that happened to me at Antioch at Iconium and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Now, these persecutions occurred during Paul's first ministry, uh, missionary journey. And it's believed that Timothy was present during these times. He was an eyewitness to the culmination of them in Lystra, where Paul was stoned outside the city and left for dead, only to get up and walk right back into the city. Timothy saw this. He witnessed this. And the point Paul is making here to Timothy, knowing of Paul's persecutions, he followed him anyway. He, he was not dismayed by Paul being left for dead after being stoned. Again, this is further evidence of the power of God at work in him. This is further evidence of his faithful ministry. He was willing, ready uh, to endure whatever the Lord had for him, including persecution. Timothy was experiencing persecution, as I mentioned, even at the time of this letter. And the fact that the Lord had already delivered him from that persecution, from those persecutions in the past, Paul encourages him. He encourages him that the Lord would be, as he had already been in the past, what? Faithful to do so again in the future. We must take courage from this as well. We must look back over our lives and see the evidence of his work in our heart, of his work in our life, of his sanctifying work in us. And then look forward. Paul transitions again in verse 12, this time looking again to the future. And he gives Timothy, as well as every fo faithful follower of Christ, an encouraging warning. An encouraging warning. Verse 12, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. This is sobering, isn't it? Paul expands the, the encouraging warning to everyone who is a follower of Christ. The, the all is universal to every true believer. Everyone who desires to live a godly life 
is opposed to a life dedicated to the worship of self, if you desire to live righteously, you will be persecuted. That's the warning. The, the encouraging part of the warning is that when we face persecution, brothers and sisters, on, the name, on account of the name of Christ, when we suffer due to our faith, when the world looks at us and desires nothing more than to f- make us faint, to make us wilt, to make us turn, to spit us out, and when we respond by standing firm, we know. We know that when we are persecuted as Paul was, as, as Timothy was, it's because we are living a godly life. Do you desire to live a godly life? Does your life look different than that of the world around you? What would your spouse say? Your children say? What would your coworkers say? Or your classmates? What would the other parents in your kid's school say? Or your child's teacher? Or coach? Believer, we we are called commanded to be light in a dark world. We are not effective for the sake of Christ and for the gospel if if we cloak that light in a shroud of darkness. The world doesn't persecute people who look like they do, does it? The world celebrates even professing Christians that reject the faith. The world celebrates professing Christians that reject the truth in Scripture, that embraces its agenda. Uh, The world puts them on a platform, uh, parades them around as test cases in order to be faithful believers, to beat faithful believers into submission. The world gives them talk shows. The only ones being persecuted are those who live godly lives, lives that stand apart from the world. Lives that function as lights to a dark world as the darkness flees from the light, hates the light. And and Paul, he means this as encouragement. It is encouragement. In in the midst of difficult persecution and suffering, we can rejoice in knowing that, that it is evidence of God's sanctifying works in our hearts, in our lives. We can rejoice in knowing that he is being revealed through the testimony of our lives to a dark world around us. We can rejoice in that we know the gospel is going forth by way of our suffering, as Paul says in Philippians 1. In his final address as the dean of the seminary, as I mentioned earlier, Dr. Zimich said this in reference to this verse. He says, He will never, ever leave, abandon, or forsake you. That's the greatest news, right? That is the greatest news. The greatest news is that Jesus Christ, God himself, will never leave us. He will never abandon us. He will never forsake us. As things are going, he says, from bad to worse, morally, it's a terrible situation around us, and you face dark days ahead. Don't fear, because God, Jesus Christ, the commander-in-chief, is always with you. Believer, beware of the so-called church. Take courage in the testimony of your life and immerse yourself. Number three, immerse yourself in the Word. Immerse yourself in the Word. Verses 16 and 17 of this passage are two of the most familiar verses to every church body that holds God's Word in high esteem. They are actually the first two verses referenced in in this church's doctrinal statement. They're the first two verses referenced in my church's doctrinal statement. They are diagrammed by ladies' Bible studies. They are beaten up and chewed on by men's Bible studies. They are hung on children's church walls. Entire church conferences are surrounded and and based on these two verses, verses 16 and 17 of this passage. These two verses are synonymous with Bible-believing, 
gospel-preaching churches that exposit the Word. We know them. My guess is you could, you could recite them right now. However, when we place them within the context in, in which Paul is writing to Timothy, is writing to the New Testament church, they become so much richer. They become so much deeper, so much more encouraging, so much more awe-inspiring, so much more clear, even. They are the buttress, the the reinforcement, the, the, the strengthening fortification for this third instruction for the last days. Again, Paul issues... Paul issues his final warning in the form of command in verses 1 through 9, instructing him to to understand that in the last days, evil people will cause havoc and distress and difficulty like wild animals in the church, that they will live lives marked by evil and undevoted allegiance to, to the God of self, that they will seep into the church and attempt to, to co-opt it for their own means and, and for their own profit as we see all around us today. And that the so-called church, professing believers, will follow suit and will profess religion, but look just like the world. And then he encourages Timothy in verse 10 by way of pointing back at the sanctifying work uh, that God has exacted in his life. He reminds him of how he followed the teachings of the Lord. He reminds him of the evidence of his own conduct and other characteristics that mark the that mark a faithful believer, that mark a man who is not disqualified, but but instead is rescued by God at every turn and is held by Him for all of eternity. He reminds him of his own persecutions and sufferings in verse 11. And that he should draw encouragement from even those. Verses 12 and 13, Paul looks into, into the future and tells Timothy that that all faithful believers who live a godly life, who look different from the world, who refuse to go along with the the passions of the flesh, who refuse to share the Christian stage with those who betray the gospel, all faithful believers, you and me, will be persecuted. And that the world's not getting better, but even more evil. And his imposters, imposters won't stop deceiving and they won't stop being deceived. We, we feel the weight of the world pressing in on us, don't we? These things Paul is writing to Timothy, this, this look into the future, man, it feels like it's right here, right now, does it not? We all know where we are. We all know how different we are from the world around us. Or or perhaps even how different we desire to be. What are we to do with this? And how are we to respond? Our third instruction for the last days, immerse yourself in God's will. Look with me in verse 14. He says, he writes, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed. He he writes, don't grow weary. Don't panic. Don't turn back. Press on. Uh, Again, a reminder to not look for new doctrines, new ideas, new ways to reach out to and live in a fallen world. Don't get captured by the Janus and Jambres out there. But instead, get captured by what you already know, by what you have already firmly believed. Abide in the Word. Live and dwell in the Word. Dive deeper into the Word. Fully immerse yourself in the Word. Now this isn't a natural response, is it? When when the pressures of life get difficult, when the outside world presses in on you and is beating you down, when everything is going from, from bad to worse, than maybe you can even imagine, When the deception of the world is suffocating, your first response is always to run to Scripture, right? Can can I be transparent again? 
not always my first response. You know, the temptation in, in my own heart is to hide, uh, to ignore, to pretend like nothing's happening, to, to run to comfort uh, and entertainment, to, to figure things out on my own, to explore the, the all-knowing internet for answers. I need this instruction. Now, church, you need this instruction. Timothy needed this instruction. Christian, we, we, when you can't make sense of what is up and down, when it's so very difficult to determine what is true and what is not, which I think defines this age that we're in, when you can't figure out what, what side of history you're currently standing on, we know. We, we know. We understand what we've already firmly believed. We know where the firm ground is for us to stand on. Our foundation is sure. It is set on the cornerstone of Christ. It's built on the words of the apostles and the prophets. It's recorded by eyewitnesses of God's majestic power. It has always been firm. It has always been true. It has always been faithful, believer. It is God's word. And he says, continue, continue in what you already know. And he doesn't stop there. He goes on, knowing from whom you've learned it, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings. Uh, I'm sure as Timothy is reading this letter from Paul, faces are popping into his mind. Uh, faces uh, most likely of his grandmother Lois uh, and his mother Eunice. He must have recalled the, the countless days that he walked with Paul and listened to Paul as Paul poured God's word into him, the doctrines into him. There's no doubt he remembered that those people poured not only God's word into him, but, the, but their own lives, that they weren't looking for anything in return. Not like the so-called believers who, who have ulterior motives. I read this, and I think of the, the men of my own life uh, who relentlessly and graciously gave of themselves week after week, uh, sharing the gospel with me, sharing ministry with me, uh, sharing life with me, walking through life together. Their aim? To acquaint me with the sacred writings. To help me to know God more through His Word. And I think of men like Joey. Joey and I were young men in the faith together. We played games, football, basketball. Uh, he's not very good, by the way. We shared countless meals together. Uh, we worked together. Uh, we had the same friends. We had the same the sa shared interests. We raised families together. And those are great memories. But those aren't the things that endear me to Joey. And those aren't the things that endear Joey to me, or me to Joey, however you say it. It's our, our mutual love for Christ. It's our 15-year growing desire to know Christ more and to walk with Him closer to help one another become more acquainted and familiar with the sacred writings. I'm thankful to be here now, as I mentioned, and, and to see that the Lord is giving him and you the divine opportunity uh, to make history together, to share the gospel with one another, to share ministry with one another, to share your lives with one another, to evangelize with one another, so that when the world and the so-called church attacks and presses in and suffocates you, you can more intimately and readily recall the firm foundation on which you stand so that the first reaction to trial will more often be to run to God's Word. That's what Paul is commanding us here. Again, look at verse 15 with me. He says, And how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The impostors were, were marked by a professed religiosity but denied the power of God. We must continue to immerse ourselves in God's Word because that is where His power is found. It's in His Scripture. 
that we come face to face with God's self-disclosure. It's in his scripture that we find the good news of forgiveness of sins. It's in the scripture that we meet Jesus, our Lord and Savior and great high priest. It's in scripture where we're, we're equipped to go out each day and tell the world that they are lost. To tell them they are sinners and they deserve God's wrath. No different than you and me apart from Christ. And also to tell them that they can find forgiveness at the foot of the cross. And they can be saved through the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Which brings us to verse 16 and 17. When Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones stood against the ecumenical movement in the 60s and 70s, he he didn't just stand in opposition to something. He, He also stood in affirmation of something. Speaking of their desire to pray for unity of the Catholic and liberal Protestant church, for those who denied the closed fist doctrines of the faith and in the faithful churches, he said this, but what right have we to pray for this, this being the, the false manufactured unity, or to expect that he will honor or bless anything but the truth that he himself enabled the authors of the Old Testament and the New Testament to write. To ask him to do so is not only near blasphemy, but also the height of of folly. So in response, Dr. Mor- Dr. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones responded by, by turning to God's Word, uh, diving deeper into it, and, and so must we. Verse 16, all Scripture is breathed out by God. The source of Scripture is, is the Almighty God, the beginning and the end the creator of all things, the sustainer of all things. It's breathed out by Him. His Word, infallible, never changing. His Word is fixed in the heavens, Psalm 119.89. There is no limit to its perfection, Psalm 119.96. His righteous rules endure forever, Psalm 119.160. They never get old. They never get old. They never fall out of use. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So why do we run to the world? Why do we run to things other than Scripture when it's very clear that it's God's breathed out Word, infallible, and where we find teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness? Do you want to be a godly Christian? Do you want to live a godly life? The answer to that, if you desire to do that, is right here in His Word. Run to nothing else. Immerse yourself in God's Word. We we don't need to look out there. We don't need to grasp for truth. Everything we need to know is right in God's Word. You want to be taught? You want to be reproved? Corrected? Trained? Righteous? Holy? right here in God's Word. And and let's not forget, God's righteousness is the plumb line, right? The the plumb line. God's standard is the bar. If your desire is to honor the Lord in all that you do, the only place you will find out how to do that is in His breathed out Word. Verse 17 says that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Believer, immerse yourself in God's Word. Dive deep into it. And as the world immerses deeper into sin, the church immerses deeper into holiness. As the world gets darker, the church gets lighter. As persecution becomes more frequent, so does our joy as the world moves further and further away from God, the church draws closer and closer to Him through His breathed out Word. 
lady who, the world doesn't know what to do with you, does it? On one hand, it, it wants you to be nothing more than a hollow shadow of fleeting external beauty. Fighting with age and ignoring reality. On the other, it, it wants you to be a man. To function like a man. To, to live like a man. To deny the woman God designed you to be. Instead of following after the world and, and adorning yourself in the way that the imposters would have you be, adorn yourself as First Timothy 2.10 says, with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. And when you do, when you adorn yourself with good works, when you adorn yourself with righteousness and godliness, you will stand out. You will look different. The light of Christ will shine through you to a dark world that needs a Savior. And God will be glorified for it. Men, we too, like the women, are, are being attacked on all sides. How in the world are we, how in the world is a man to look and function in today's society? Well, on one hand, it's been it's become the cultural norm for men to lie down and abdicate their God-given role as leader. And on the other, there's a movement uh, to define a man as someone who is shallow, uh, to define a man who is someone who only does uh, manly things. In fact, in October, this past October, um, you, you kind of missed out. You could have attended a, a Christian men's conference where you could have gone and learned how to act like men. And they taught uh, men how to throw axes and run obstacle courses and how to attend car shows. It's kind of insulting, isn't it? If that wasn't enough, when they finished all doing all those manly things, you could have sat under the biblical teaching of a keynote speaker who is an adulterating, unqualified former pastor who has been found out. Who is like a magician proclaiming the name of Christ while dipping into your back pocket. Men, we do not need to throw axes and attend car shows and run obstacle courses to be men. We need to act like men. And not those fake men. We need to get serious about being men of God's word. Men who love and lead our wives in a godly and sacrificial way. But men who raise our children in the admonition of the Lord pouring God's doctrines into them, pouring God's doctrines into our own hearts, into our own minds, not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewal of our own minds. Men who are striving to be able to one day honestly and sincerely utter these words to the men coming after us. The time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are, I am humbled under your word where we fall short in so many ways. And yet, Lord, we know that uh, we depend on the power of the Spirit. We depend on your sanctifying work in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives. In order to be faithful to you, to be light to a dark world. Lord, I, I pray that you will give us strength and resolve 
to do life to a fallen world. To be identified, to be able to identify the so-called church and avoid them at all costs. To be encouraged by the work that you are doing in our own hearts and our own lives. And to run deeply and more fervently into your word. Seeking to know you better. To love you more faithfully. Lord, we are so encouraged to know that you are doing this work in us. And that you have given us this opportunity to honor you in all that we do. We ask, Lord, that you will help us to stand firm and to be faithful. To continue to do so. To do so all the more. We love you. And we thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen.